Please welcome back to the stage, Deb Rock. Well, we've talked a lot about conservation design delivery and the science behind it this morning. And it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Rick Coleman. When I asked Rick for a little bit of a bio, he said, ah, I've been around a long time and I've done almost every job. So um, I did manage to get a little bit more out of him. Rick started his career in 1977 as a refuge biologist at the Pacific and Hawaiian Island National Wildlife Refuge Complex. And then he's held a prog progression of field and regional Washington office um, jobs in the National Wildlife Refuge system. He's worked for visitor services, natural resources, the whole thing. He has held a lot of jobs. Um, and for those of you that have been around as long as he has, you know that he provided an integral piece for the Promises uh, Conference over a decade ago. I've gotten to know, know Rick over the year that I've been in refuges as um, a guy who's not afraid to say what he thinks. He's not at all shy. Um, Rick is now the ARD um, of refuges and the partners program in um, the Plains and Rocky Mountain region, region six. Um, please welcome Dr. Rick Coleman, the old, the bold, Dr. Rick Coleman. Thank you. Tom, I never worked in region three. It's a pleasure to be here today. 13 years ago, I had planned to be at the Fulfilling the Promise. We worked on that for 18 months, and I was co-chair with John Doble. It was our first time to get all our refuge project leaders together in one place. Initially, we called it the Million Dollar Coffee Break. <laughs> and at the time, a million dollars was a lot of money for refuges, and we figured, well, if we're going to bring all the refuge managers together and they all drink coffee and networking was the most important part, as it is this week, we better do something more than just drink coffee because it's a million bucks. And so we decided we better work on something and how about a vision, maybe a vision document, maybe you know, talk about our future. And so we started to develop that process. And that led to the Conference at Keystone and Fulfilling the Promise document. The term Fulfilling the Promise came from a speech we wrote on our way to Pelican Island to film a video to be shown at Keystone. And on the dashboard of the rental car, we're changing the script, working on it, working on it. Janet Tennyson and I were working on this script. And we came up with the phrase Fulfilling the Promise the promise that Paul Craigle started. And if you've seen the video, it's one man and one boat trying to conserve those water birds at Pelican Island. So that was a pretty cool thing to do. Well, 13 years ago, my wife was pregnant. We had had a miscarriage, so we were really anxious for this pregnancy to go through. People used to tease me that I had poor family planning. I knew the conference was coming, and my wife's pregnant. But we wanted that baby. And the Friday before Keystone, the doctor said, she looks like she'll have the baby soon. You can go to Keystone, but you'll miss the birth of Philip. So I stayed home. If there's anybody here that is due this week, please exit the building. <laughs> Philip is now almost 13, going into seventh grade. He's about that tall. So it's high time that we develop a new vision. I always know how many months and years it's been since Keystone, because I had that daily reminder. He's eating me out of house and home also. <laughs> I wanted this opportunity to, to, to talk to you personally about where we are in the refuge system and what we need to do individually to fulfill our promise to, to conserve the future. But before I jump into that, I want to put in a plug and bear me the, the uh, indulgence of 34 years in the refuge system. I have learned an awful lot in my last nine years working in Region 6. 
And the two things that I, I learned about the refuge system that I did not know prior to working in Region 6 was number one, the Small Wetlands Acquisition Program and the wetland management districts that they operate in. Those districts are counties. Our project leaders have assignments of four or five counties. Thousands and thousands and thousands of acres. Hours of driving all over these counties to administer our, our wetland management district, our easements, and our fee-owned lands. And that is a landscape approach that we have taken for over 50 years, folks. Small Wetlands Acquisition Program has been around for 50 years. It was designed because we were rapidly losing the wetlands of the prairie potholes. And that effort that started back in the late 50s has blossomed and been very, very successful. But for that Small Wetlands Acquisition Program, we would not have learned about working at the landscape level. We would not have learned how we needed to work with our neighbors and work through easements and work with our ranchers. We would not have had that idea. And then 22 years ago, the Partners for Fish and Wildlife program was announced. That started in Region 3 and 6 by refuge folks starting to work beyond the boundaries of the refuge, taking their heavy equipment and their expertise and helping their neighbors restore wetlands that had been drained. And that Partners for Fish and Wildlife program has blossomed. But I never knew the impact of the Partners Program until I worked in Region 6, where it is phenomenal in what it has achieved across the landscape, both to the benefit of the National Wildlife Refuge System and our resources, but through the entire landscape in Region 6 and all the states. It's a fantastic program. In my stump speech, and I always have a stump speech, my stump speech since working in Region 6 is the Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program is the best thing that ever happened to refuges. Refuges needs the Partners Program because those folks have an entire different set of talents and personalities than the typical refuge employee. And those folks have taught us in Region 6, us refuge folks in Region 6, how to work with others, how to have landscape conversations with our neighbors and with our counties and our communities. And so it's the best thing that ever happened to refuges in Region 6 and in Region 3. So it's in the Promises Vision document. I support that, and please give me that deference. <clears throat> now to get personal. I talked to a few folks and said, well, what do, what do they need to hear? What would you tell them? It seems really hard now, doesn't it? Everybody wants something out of you. There's no time. You're low on resources. It seems harder than it ever was. Harder than it was when I was a refuge biologist in Hawaii coming to work in a bathing suit, t-shirt, and flip-flops. It's a lot harder than that. It seems that way. But let me tell you that we've been through hard times before, and we'll be, get through this one also. And it helps that we're all in this together. It helps to have a common vision of where we're going. But there's three things that you all need to remember that you have the capacity for that kept us going in those old times when we had to go through struggles. The three things are thinking, courage, and heart. Now we do not do enough thinking. In our office in Denver, we have a expectation just on our floor that we are going to think 25% of the time. We thought we'd start small, <laughs> work on it. Some are actually thinking more than 25% of the time, but on average, we are trying to think 25% of the time. 
And we talk about it, we laugh about it, but what we're trying to challenge each other to do is to let go of the crank. We come to work and we start where we were last, the day before, and we turn the crank of work. And we turn it, sometimes we turn it nine hours a day and get comp time. <laughs> but we turn that crank. And it doesn't take any thinking to turn the crank. And so what we're trying to do is let go of the crank, head up, look around, and think. Think about what you're doing. Think about what you're discussing. Think about where you're going. Think about, are, am I using the best available science? Am I considering all the other parameters? What is the context of the question? As refuge managers doing wildlife biology, you have a set of science knowns. You're applying adaptive management processes, but you're applying it in habitats where most of the things you're dealing with are still unknown. That requires a lot of thinking because you're constantly dealing with, okay, I got this piece of science and I got this adaptive management and I'm, I hope it's right. And that's the whole purpose of adaptive management, of course, is, is thinking through this and making modifications. But it's the thinking part. And too often, we keep turning the same old crank and we keep spending our time on things that don't matter, like email like blackberries, stuff like that. Um, we have got to take our hand off the crank and think more, critical thinking. I used to have the expression, if it doesn't happen in the field, it doesn't happen. If it doesn't happen in the field, it doesn't happen. And I was told not to say that anymore because it offended regional office employees and the Washington office because they believe they're not in the field. Well, when I started saying that, I was in the Washington office. And I was using it with our staff to remind them that our job is not done until we affect what is done at the field level in the field. And the same goes for the regional office. Our job in the regional office is not done until our field stations fully understand and feel supported and we can carry through our policies and our appropriations and our targeted vision at the habitat level. But I would also challenge the field stations here today that the job is not done until it's done in your habitats. The job is not done while you sit at your computer or refill your coffee cup. The job is done when you get out of the office, you get out in the field, you pay attention to what's going on, you learn to see again and to think again about what is out there. So this adage of it, it doesn't happen until it happens in the field also carries for the field stations. I think a lot of our field stations, we, we Washington office and the regional office, suck them in to their offices instead of pushing them out to the field. And we get them turning the crank of email. We want you to think more. The next thing we want you to have is courage. I get a lot of interviews from stepping up the leadership and ALDP folks, and they ask about what are the five most important traits of leadership, and you know, there's books about that stuff. But there's only one trait that really matters, and that's courage. You could have all the skills to be a great leader 
and have them well, well honed. But if you don't have the courage to step up and be a leader, all those traits are useless. You have to have the courage to have radical thinking. You have to have the courage to challenge. Challenge science. Science is about challenging. That's how science gets better, is through challenge. It's the scientific process. Scientists need to have courage. We need to have courage to be radical thinkers, to find ways of being loyal to the organization and to the truth. Organizations need radical thinkers to keep things going, to challenge the thought, to challenge you to think. Radical thinkers aren't always welcome, but we need them. And we need you all to have courage to use your talents. What would you do if you weren't afraid? What would you do if you weren't afraid? That's the thing I want you to keep thinking about as you go through your life, as you go to meetings, as you go make this tough personnel decisions and things like that. Often we use the fear affects our ability to think. We think less. So getting back to think more requires you to have courage to think and to speak up. Now, I'm not here trying to incite a riot or tyranny. There's a proper way to do this. But the refuge system in the future needs all of you to think, to speak up, and to contribute your talents, and to be not afraid. And the last thing that we've had for a long, long time, and I'm not sure how much we have right now, is our heart, our passion for the National Wildlife Refuge System and for conservation. Now, I loved the Region 3, Region 2 uh, expose about hoorah, who's, who's in Region 3, who's in Region 2. That's passion for their organization. But there's also a passion within each part of the Fish and Wildlife Service, or at least there should be. And if Refuges wants to be as passionate as possible, that doesn't mean the other parts of the service can't be equally passionate about their mission. And together, we have more heart. If you're feeling kind of low and stuff like that, it doesn't mean that the next person can't have heart. We need to exhort our employees to have heart. We need to expect our workplace to be kind and considerate and heartfelt as we do our work. We need to regain, rekindle our passion for our job. Recently, I was asked to help out with the science integrity uh, issues facing the Department of Interior and Fish and Wildlife Service. And I was surprised how excited I got to be working specifically in science and science processes and peer review and scientific endeavors, the whole science thing. What was your favorite subject when you were in school? Other than recess, what was your favorite subject? How many said science was your favorite subject? And how many people get to do that a lot right now? You had the capacity, you had the passion, 
You joined the Fish and Wildlife Service because of your science avocation, your passion for science. And you don't do much of it anymore. And you don't feel that, ah, that rush that you did when you got an A in your science class. Yes, I picked the right subject. You need to get back to those roots of passion. You need to get back to science. Science is knocking on the door, folks. It's saying, let me in, refuges. Let's do more science. Let's think more. Let's challenge more. Let's challenge each other more. Let's use more science and peer review and critical thinking. That's why you joined the Fish and Wildlife Service to use your science interest. And we need you to. In the next 10 years, Congress, the taxpayers, everyone is going to expect more and more accountability, not just on how you spend your maintenance money. Uh, we have SAMs for that. They want to know, ultimately, what is the difference you're making out there in the field for the habitat and for your resources. How are you meeting your objectives? They want to know that. And that requires thinking, science, courage, and passion. If it doesn't happen in the field, it doesn't happen. If it doesn't happen in the field, it's up to you. Thank you very much.